I would like to uh, comment on, on tonight's sermon a little bit. The, I changed it the last minute. I, uh, certain events that have taken place over the last several days uh, caused me to give some thought to the sermon, and I changed it. So sermon could be a little bit shorter. I don't know uh, as I go through it. Uh, but we've seen some, some events taking place. The, uh, the current earthquake and uh, volcanic eruption that's taken place in Hawaii is rather interesting. Fortunately, it is not, uh, hasn't caused deaths. But again, it's a rather, uh, a rather amazing thing to see. But it did bring back some memories. And then in addition to that, my wife and I have witnessed the death of several people, two people that are very close to us this past week. And additionally, we have a very good friend. These are all brethren from the church and that we've known for many, many, many years. And he's currently in the hospital in rather, uh, rather tough shape right now. So anyway, uh, we need to pray for all the brethren, especially those that are in need of our prayers for healing. But with that, and these events and these things that took place gave me cause to think about the sermon that I wanted to give, so I changed it at the last minute. And for people that like titles, I'll give you a title. It's very simple. It's one word. It's today. It's the name of the title, today. You know, tomorrow, many of us will attend Sabbath services, we're gonna hear sermons concerning God's work with humanity, some of his plans, things that he intends. But that's tomorrow, and today is today. So again, if you want a title, just call it today. Now again, these recent deaths of people that I know gave me cause to actually reconsider this sermon. Now, I want you to think about this. We have three phases to our life, three phases. We have yesterday or the past. In other words, all those events that have taken place in our life up to this point. Then we have today. We have today or current events. And those are the things happening right now as we progress forward. And then we have tomorrow or the future. And those are all the things that have happened to us in the past. You know, when we consider yesterday or our past, you know, we may have many pleasant thoughts, perhaps some regrets, things that we did do, things that we didn't do. I certainly have some of those. I know I, I have given that thought to that. However, the past is just that, it's the past. Now, regardless of what you think, there's nothing you can do to change those events that have already taken place in your life. You just cannot do it, they're gone. And when we look at tomorrow, you know, we may have plans or scheduled events we're looking forward to, for, for example, as I mentioned, uh, we may have plans for attending a Sabbath service tomorrow. However, do you have any guarantee that you will be there in that event? Today and what is happening here and now is the only thing that guarantees your participation. Now I'll get into that a little bit more as we move forward. But what part of what brought this on? Several years ago, I believe, I'm going to say, I believe it was 2015. As I was driving along, and again, when I look at this, this uh, volcanic eruption taking place in Hawaii, but as I was driving, I heard about the tremendous earthquake in Nepal. I think some of you may remember that. It, it brings back memories to me because my brother, who was a senior executive in the CIA, and he was in charge of Asian operations, and we, we had had a discussion about Kathmandu, where he had visited up there. Uh, so it kind of brought back a lot of thoughts when I thought about the, uh, the, the earthquake in Nepal. And yet, think about it, that one event 
In just a short period of time, there were over 6,500 people were dead. Go on. They had no tomorrow. Now, don't misunderstand me. I realize that these people will be resurrected at a later time. We know what God's plan is. But here, I'm referring to the physical time that they had here on earth. You see, they had today, but they had no tomorrow. Then I also thought about the school shootings, the ones recently in Florida. Kids that went to school never came home. They had no tomorrow. Boston bomber, we all remember that. Once again, people dead, they had no tomorrow. There's train wrecks, there's airplane disasters, and of course there's just a multitude of other things that always stop life short of tomorrow. That's when I got to thinking about what I would do if I had no tomorrow. And I would ask you, what would you do if you had no tomorrow? You know, we're very fortunate because we know God's plan, so we have a sincere hope in the future. But are we convinced that we have done all that we could possibly do if there is no tomorrow? You know, I truly believe that we live in a rat race that keeps us from doing all the things that we should be doing. I, I can tell you from personal experience, when I was much younger, I had five kids at home, wife that didn't work, and I worked two full-time jobs. I lived in a rat race. I saw a graduation card recently that once read, welcome to the rat race, and how true that describes the life that we live in today. How busy are we just trying to maintain what we refer to as our standard of living? You know, I remember many times, <laughs> many times I would just wanted the world to stop and let me get off and take a breather. Have you ever felt that way? You know, I believe I've read the book of Ecclesiastes probably more than any other book in the Bible. Don't ask me why, but it's probably because I've spent much of my life like Solomon, searching for answers to life as a natural man. I'd like to go ahead and turn there. Notice in Ecclesiastes 1. Let's go ahead and turn there. In Ecclesiastes 1, and in verse 3, Notice, notice what Solomon has to say here. He says, what profit does the man have in all his labor which he labors under the sun? And notice, his whole search was for physical things as labor under the sun. You see, Solomon is wrapped up in the nature of life and he tries to understand why things happen as they do. But notice what he finds, notice what he finds. In Ecclesiastes 1 and verses 14 and 15, what he finds is frustration. He says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is made crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. And Solomon intensifies his search. And he tries using understanding, he tries pleasure and the things that make him feel good. Then he tries mirth and what he thought to be the fun things in life. But instead he finds misery. He tried comedy, but instead he found chaos. He tried wine, oh, wine, but finds it wanting and lacking the satisfaction that he desires. He tries diversions. He tries all kinds of diversions and he finds them disappointing. But then he tries to find the meaning in his great projects. 
He tries agriculture. He tries architecture. Let's, let's jump over to chapter two and notice in chapter two and in verses four through six, Solomon says, I made great works for myself. Notice how many times he uses that I and myself. I made great works for myself. And notice he's trying to please himself. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and orchards for myself. I planted trees in them of all fruit. I made pools of water for myself to irrigate groves of growing trees. But he doesn't give up there. He doesn't give up. He, he heard something click on there. He tries mansions. He tried building those. He tried music. And notice in verse 8, he said, I also gathered silver and gold to myself and the treasure of kings and of the provinces. And I got men singers and women singers for myself. Again, that word myself. Even the sensual delights of the sons of men and many women. Now notice that. I think between concubines and wives, he had about a thousand women. But he also tries power and position. Notice in verses 9 and 11. He says, so I was great. I again. I was great and I increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. And notice also my wisdom remained with me. Well, you talk about vanity. Talk about vanity. Verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of all my labor. Notice here in verse 11, the outcome of all this searching and all these physical pleasures. He says, then I looked on all the works that my hand had done and on the labor that I had labored to do, and what was the final result? He said, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind, and there is no profit under the sun. What does the Bible tell us? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? How do you know if you're in this rat race? How do you know? possibly if you're exhausting yourself to gain material possessions. Is that your goal? Is that what you're searching for? I, like I said, I worked two full-time jobs and it probably gave my kids a little better home, but it wasn't worth the time that I gave away. If you work night and day to keep up with others, which I did at one time, you're in the rat race. If your life centers around yourself instead of others, you're probably in a rat race. You see, Solomon focused his life on the physical pleasures of life, and he took none of the things that he labored for with him when he left, when he died. So I ask, if you knew you had no tomorrow, would you use today to pursue the physical pleasures of life. You know, there's important things that we need to do today in the event that there is no tomorrow. You know, I mentioned I'm the father of several children. Actually, uh, it is a second marriage for me. My wife and I, she had four children, I had five. So we've actually had a hand in raising all nine of those children. And I not only love them, but I want their love. You know, we have a heavenly father and he not only loves us, but he wants our love. You know, I'm hurt when I don't hear from my children. Sometimes I go, go a long ways and I don't hear from them and I get hurt. 
And God has the same reaction if he doesn't hear from us. And notice, and, and we're all familiar with this, but notice that all the commandments hinge on just two. Let's go ahead and turn to Mark 12. Rather than Matthew, I'm going to use Mark in this case. Turn to Mark 12. And in Mark 12, here in verse 28, you know, we have the scribe, and he asked, asked Jesus, he said, which is the first commandment of all? And then in verse 12, Jesus answered, and he said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, our one God is the Lord, the Lord. Now, of course, here, it's re he's actually reflecting back here on Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 when he, when he uses that. But then it says in verse 30, when he says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. If there were no tomorrow, would you not want God? Would you not want to let God know of how much you love him and how much you appreciate him? Would you not want to thank him for all that he's done for you? And let him know how grateful you are for the food and the clothing and the housing and all the other things that he provides for you and your family and your nation. We're very fortunate we live in a wonderful nation. If there were no tomorrow, it would be too late. Have you ever gotten so busy that you go through about half the day and you realize you haven't even taken time to pray and thank God for the day? I feel bad, I have to admit, I, I, that's happened to me, I'm guilty. Jesus continues in Mark, he continues in verse 31, and he said, and the second is like this. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. If there is no tomorrow, would you want to let your parents know how much you love and appreciate them? Mine are gone. Grandparents are gone. Got a brother that's gone. How about your wife? How about your husband? How about letting your children know that you love them? And if you're still harbored any bitterness toward others, would you not want to resolve those issues and leave with the clear conscience? You know, Jesus taught that we were even to love our, our enemies. And you don't need to turn there, but in Luke 6 and verse 35, Jesus told us, he said, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward should be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is good to the unthankful and to the wicked. Brethren, we do indeed live in a busy world with plenty of things to grab and keep our attention. I know, and I have the propensity to procrastinate and put things off for another day. I've done that with sermons a few times, and I panic at the end when I realize I got a sermon coming up, and it's not ready. But we never know when there will be another day. Showing our love to God and our fellow man is not something that can wait until there is no tomorrow. There's only today. You know, our trip to the grave is indeed something that's going to happen. There's no doubt about that. However, I sometimes think that man has swallowed the lie of Satan the devil. Remember in the Garden of Eden, when he told Eve that you shall not surely die, and it surely appears that millions of people live as if that lie were the truth today. Too many of us store up riches at, as with as if we're never going to leave them. Maybe we just need a little better house. You know, Joe, Joe Smith down the street's got a little better house. I need to work a little harder, get a little better house.
you know, how about a big fat bank account? How about, how about a nice boat? I thought about that. I owned a boat one time and I found out very quickly, I lived on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland for a while and I found out that a boat is nothing but a big hole in the water you pour money into. But you know, if that's what we chase after, what a waste. But we know that Satan did lie. And we're told in Hebrews 9 and in verse 27 that, and inasmuch as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Brethren, the grave awaits the rich and the poor alike. Solomon didn't take anything with him. How often are we stopped for a funeral procession driving down the road. You know, it's really interesting too. People pull over, they stop for a funeral procession, but they won't stop for an ambulance trying to save somebody's life. But we see that, we see the funeral processions. We each have an appointment with death. We all reach a day when there will be no tomorrow. And of course, physically speaking, of course, are you prepared for that day? I wonder, how many of those 6,500 people in Nepal were prepared and knew they would not have a tomorrow? Do you suppose the rich and the highly educated of the world are better prepared? I don't care how many degrees you have behind your name from whatever university or how much wealth you've accumulated in a lifetime, Notice in Psalm 49, Psalm 49. In Psalm 49, because it paints a pretty clear picture here of the path for mankind. So let's begin, let's begin reading in verse six. It says, those who trust in their wealth and in their many riches boast themselves. No man can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of the soul is costly, and no payment is enough. That he should live forever and never see corruption. So much for the accumulation of wealth. Now, how about the educated? Verse 10. For he sees wise men die, like the fool and the brutish person, that they perish together and they leave their wealth to others. You know, wealth and things that comfort by themselves are not evil, but they won't prepare you for anything beyond this physical life that we live in. Notice in verse 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall go on forever and their dwelling places to all generations. Notice they even call their lands after their own names. But this does not prepare them to meet their maker. And in verse 12, it says, Nevertheless, man, though high in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the way of the foolish and of their followers who delight in their sayings. Verse 14, like sheep, they are appointed to the grave. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall have rule over them in the morning, and their form shall decay in the grave far from their home. This, this is what we all face. You know, we cannot place our trust in the physical things of life. The smartest people in the world haven't found any solution for death. We're all taught about healthy living, and I've, I've listened to many. We've got some in the church that, that certainly have degrees, and they can teach you some very good things about health and healthy living, and it can certainly enhance our physical being, but it won't prepare us for eternal life. And medical science comes up short in its effort to find a pill that will give us eternal life. You know, miracle drugs help. There's no doubt about it. But only for a season. 
They, well, science has certainly cured many, many diseases and has been helpful and certainly doctors uh, do many surgeries that help save lives. And science has conquered many of these fatal diseases, but life still ultimately ends. In spite of all our efforts, we still have an appointed time. But in spite of all this, in spite of all this, we are fortunate because we have hope. And the only preparation we can make for the grave is through faith in Christ. Notice that even Job knew his Redeemer would provide victory over the grave. Turn to Job 19. Job 19. In Job 19 and at verse 25, it says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand upon the earth in the latter days. Notice how he refers to the latter days. Brethren, there is indeed hope, but it is not in the physical things of life. I think we have often been told to live past, but to plan for the future as if you're going to live forever. We have the story of King Hezekiah when he was sick and told he would die. We find that story in 2 Kings 20. Let's go ahead and turn there. 2 Kings 20. In 2 Kings 20, let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Verse 1. It says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick to death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to him and said to him, thus says the Lord. Notice what he told him here. He said, set your house in order. Is your house in order? Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now notice he was given no hope to live and to set his house in order. Death is inevitable for all. And you don't need to turn there, but we're told in Hebrews 9.11, it is appointed unto men once to die. Simply a fact of life. You know, I, I appreciate Fred, and Fred actually made mention at the conference, and he does it many a time. And yes, we need to certainly care for those that, that are aged that die. But think about this. If they endured to the end, their next moment of consciousness will be in God's kingdom. Think about this. Adam, who was never born because he was created, he was never born, but he died. You had Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years but he died. Samson was one of the strongest men ever to live, but he died. And of course, Solomon that we just read about and talked about said that he was the wisest of all men, probably the wealthiest. He died. He didn't take it with him. And now we know that death is the result of sin. And we know that all sin and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that. Let's turn to Romans 5. In Romans 5 and in verse 12, here we're told, therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by, by means of sin came death. And in this way, death passed into all mankind. And it is for this reason that all have sinned. But we also know that Jesus came to die and pay the penalty for the sins of the world, even though he was sinless. He paid the ultimate penalty and died as a substitute for sinners. For those things that we did, 
He took it upon himself. Now, you know, we read this frequently at Passover, but as a means of encouragement, let me just read a little bit of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I'm not going to go through it all, but we read this. In verses 5 and 6, it says, But he was wounded for our infirmities, and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All must physically die, but we have hope and eternal life through the death of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing. Now let's, let's go back to 2 Kings 20 again. Let me go back there. I should have stayed there, I guess. 2 Kings 20. Second Kings 20, this is where Hezekiah was told to set his house in order because he was going to die. And like Hezekiah, Hezekiah, we ought to prepare for death. In other words, we should set our business affairs in order. Preparation for the protection of family members should be done, and especially if we have young children. Well, I'm fortunate all my, kids, all my kids are over 50 years old. But when they were young, I did have preparations and insurance to make sure they were taken care of. Love, loved ones should never be left with death. Think about that. Loved ones should never be left with death. You know, I think about that, and I remember a fellow in the church about 40 years ago, I guess, but quite a ways back. He was a deacon. And if, if any of you remember, back then they were preaching pretty soon that the world was going to end pretty quick. In fact, back in the 70s, five to seven years, and it was over. Well, he took advantage of that. He thought, if I'm just gonna, if it's going to be over anyway, I'll just borrow a lot of money and spend it. Well, eventually he had to file bankruptcy because the end did not come. But you know, by providing for our families in the event of death, it should bring us a peace of mind now and for them later on. It's just something we should do. Having faith in Christ prepares us to both live and to die. Jesus makes life worth living, as we're told in John 10 and in verse 10 of John. It says, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. But he says, I have come so that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus Christ takes the sting. He takes the sting out of dying. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Another familiar one that use at funerals, 1 Corinthians 15. And in verses 55 to 57, <clears throat> it says, oh, death, where is your sting? We just read, Christ takes the sting out of death. Oh, grave, where is your victory? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that the Apostle Paul considers when living in Christ that death is gain. Notice that. Let's, let's back up to 1 Corinthians 1. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 21. Paul speaking, he says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. But I, but I do not know what I should choose. 
He was, he was conflicted here. I don't know what to choose, life, death, for I am hard pressed to choose between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Brethren, Hezekiah learned the power of prayer and was given additional time to live. He was given 15 more years, but he still had to face the common end to mankind. Is your house in order? And are you prepared for both life and for death? Turn to Psalm 90. In Psalm 90 and verse 12, we're told, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom because we don't know the exact number. You know, I had a grandmother that died in Shelbyville, Tennessee at the age of 98 years old. She was very fortunate. She wasn't an assisted care living until she was 98 in the last several years until she was 98, but she was in relatively good health for 98. But she did die. But I also, when I consider my grandmother at 98, but I also saw my brother's son die at the age of eight years old. He died of leukemia. I tell the story sometimes and it just, it just, eats at me, but I remember my brother telling me the last day he was in the hospital with his son, and the doctors told him his son was dying, and he was trying to appease his son, and he told his son, uh, you know, he, he wasn't in our church, a church of God, but he said he was trying to tell him, he said, don't worry, son, you'll just be with the angels. And the boy looked at him, and he said, I don't want to be with the angels. I want to be with you, Dad. Eight years old. So what would I say if this were my last sermon and there was no, I would first speak to those that I love. We all have a responsibility to those that are closest to us. I think I would start by assuring my family of my faith in Christ which gives me the assurance of eternal life. How often do we see loved ones that are left behind that wonder if they will ever see us again? And when you have somebody and you see, and I won't go into it too deeply, but somebody that has been married maybe 50, 60 years, it's really hard. They have a really hard time adapting to the change. I would also assure them that through God's love, we would walk together again. I would tell them how God called me to the truth of his kingdom and that the transformation it made in my life. I would want them to know how I gave give thanks for all those that helped me share this life of faith in Christ. I, I would share with them a few scriptures to assure them of my future, such as John 6 and verse 37. John 6, verse 37, and all whom the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Or perhaps first John. Perhaps first John, first John five, and verses 11, and 11 to 13. And this is the witness that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has eternal life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, 
in order that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I would want them to know that this was not the end, but the beginning. And finally, I would assure them that I love them and God loves them. The second part of my sermon would be to tell them where I was going and that I must first sleep, once again, referring to 1 Corinthians 15 and beginning in verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15. Back to that, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We, again, this is one of those scriptures we read at funerals. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corrupt, corruptible must put on incorruptibility, and this mortal must put on immortality. And perhaps one more, and I'll just turn there, but, but and that's in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in exactly the same way also, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. These are reassuring scriptures. The third part of my sermon, I would tell them <clears throat> When I wake up from this sleep that I will be in, I will be in a much better place. I use this scripture a lot, but John describes this new world that God intends for all mankind if they come to repentance in Revelation 21, a time actually after the last great day. Revelation 21. And beginning in verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And what a wonderful, spectacular news that we get in verse 4 when it says, and I tell you what, that this has got to be some of the best scripture in the Bible, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall not be any more death or sorrow or crying, neither shall there be any more pain because the former things have passed away. This is what we're promised. This is what in the long run eventually comes after this physical life. Who would want to trade that opportunity? Who would want to trade that for what we have today? I would tell them that this is the world that I hope to share. This is the world that I hope to share eventually with all my loved ones, my wife, my mother, my father, my brothers, my sister, my children, and all those who share my faith in Christ. You know, brethren, I think of all those people that died in Nepal without having the chance to prepare for death or the school shootings, the Boston Marathon, so many of the other events that take place. And then my wife actually reminded me that after the second major quake in days, the number actually exceeded 8,000 people. 8,000. What a tragedy. This event had a tremendous impact on me. Rather, we're not guaranteed that life will last until tomorrow. But there are things we can and should do to be prepared. We can be ready. We can be ready. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6.
And starting in verse two, notice this parenthetical statement by Paul quoting Christ. He says, for he, Christ, says in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. And notice Paul's next statement. Behold, now is an acceptable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. How many tomorrows do we have? Physically, we're only guaranteed today. But we have hope because Christ has promised us a much better world to come. Brethren, we need to pray for the people of all these terrible tragedies that take place school shootings, bombings, accidents, and a multitude of other incidents that prevent someone ha from having another tomorrow. What do we have? We have today. Have we done all that we should do in the event that there is no tomorrow? Those that died will eventually have a tomorrow, but the survivors must deal with the aftermath of such horrific events. We need to be grateful. We need to be thankful to God for all the blessings that he has poured out on us individually and as a nation. And we need to take advantage of each day that we have showing our love for God and our fellow man. Thank you, brother.